Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Josh Berry, and I have the pleasure to be joined today by my colleague, Alicia Smith, who is my co-host for this webinar. I work with the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, or ASTO, where I am an analyst of health promotion and disease prevention. I'm looking forward to the rich information that we will be sharing on today's webinar, Reducing Breast Cancer Disparities at the State Level, Promising Practices from the ASTO Breast Cancer Learning Community. ASTO is the national nonprofit organization representing public health agencies in the United States, the U.S. territories, and the District of Columbia, and over 100,000 public health professionals these agencies employ. ASTO members, the chief health officials of these jurisdictions, formulate and influence sound public health policy and ensure excellence in state-based public health practice. ASTO's primary function is to track, evaluate, and advise members on the impact information of public or private health policy, which may affect them, and to provide them with guidance and technical assistance on improving the nation's health. As you can see, we have a full agenda to cover, which will feature an in-depth summary of the ASTO Breast Cancer Disparities Learning Community, presentations from all three participating states discussing successes and lessons learned, and finally, an overview of ASTO's brand new Breast Cancer Online Toolkit. Our goals on this webinar are to overview ASTO's learning community model to gain a better understanding of the breast cancer disparities in Arizona, Tennessee, and West Virginia, to overview the data-driven action steps and key successes to date from each state team, and also to learn more about the resources available, in, uh, available online in ASTO's new Breast Cancer Disparities Online Toolkit. Before we jump in, a quick note on webinar logistics. All phone lines for participants will be muted for the duration of this webinar. So please use your computer speakers or phone, but not both, to listen to today's webinar. The participant phone line and passcode is shown on screen. If you have a question, please post it to the chat box on your screen at any time. These questions will be referenced during the Q&A portion following today's state presentations. A recording of the webinar will be posted to the ASTO website in approximately two weeks and will also be sent to all participants via follow-up email. Following the conclusion of the webinar, you will be automatically directed to an evaluation survey. Please take a few minutes to provide your feedback, and we look forward to receiving your comments. I would now like to turn things over to my colleague Alicia Smith, ASTO's Director of Chronic Disease Prevention, to provide an in-depth overview of ASTO's breast cancer disparities learning community. Alicia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Josh, and hello to everyone. Thank you again for joining us. Um, today, the lessons learned that you are going to hear are really based on the framework, um, the ASTO systems change framework that we have understood to represent all of the pieces that are needed to be in place in order to improve change. And so in their own unique ways, our breast cancer learning community states Arizona, Tennessee, and West Virginia utilize that systems change framework in order to structure and operationalize what their data was showing them and how they were going to address and tackle the disparities within their state. In addition to that, we also used our reference materials from our colleagues at CDC, who you will be able to hear some from today. Um, we were looking at their data to address disparities related to race, socioeconomic status, as well as geographic location. Um, not only looking at that data um, from just a number standpoint, but really looking to say, okay, now what can we do different and what partners can we engage? And really where we started um, this sort of organizing the data across this project really rested on looking at how to best use GIS tools that are available um, to our states. And through our partnership, um, with an organization known as ESRI, we were able to offer the state some GIS licensing software, and we really started um, with a, a free course that's available to you if you're interested called Bridging the Breast Cancer Divide, um, where it walked our states through um, a scenario and then some additional options at how they could look at their data um, some different ways on how they can disseminate that information as well. And here on the slide in front of you, um, you can see that there are a number of different ways to sort of organize your dashboard in order to tell your story. And that's really what um, today's webinar is focused on, using data to tell a story. And just to make for 
sort of easier organization, we looked at um, our breast cancer learning community states data in three different buckets, one being screening, the other being the follow-up time from initial diagnosis to getting that first appointment scheduled to treatment, and then also, of course, looking at the quality of treatment. Um, we believe that based on um, research and existing um, data, that looking at the, health, the breast cancer health disparities from a race, socioeconomic status, and geographic location area um, to sort of look at it in these segmented buckets between screening, follow-up, and quality to see how each of those things um, are then affected across each state. And so we really had to start with talking about, you know, what do you have? Um, at the state level, you have access to epidemiologists, you have your cancer registry, you have um, other state and community assessment data, and then um, some of our state partners had existing data sharing agreements. And so looking at all of those things to really gather and formulate an in-depth story. And particularly, we found that the cancer registries really help to monitor trends, look at patterns. They really help the states to set some priorities um, when it came time for them to do some action planning. Um, it helps to advance research by looking at those issues from a localized area, and then also really informing the national database of what's going on at the state level, as well as what states are doing to address those things. Um, we learned um, very much so that the state registries were critical to really understanding the burdens within the state and the risks that were there. Um, more importantly, when it came time for the states to begin doing some action planning, it helped them to target their program focus as well as identify the disparate groups and see where the resources were existing and where there were some pockets within their state where the resources were either non-existent or didn't have as large of a service area for the demand in that area. And of course, it helps to investigate the causes and possible excess cases um, within a given area. And so um, here on these next slides just demonstrate some of the data sources that our states utilize in order to formulate their story, um, organize their stakeholders, get everyone on one page, and then move into that um, position of planning. So each of our states today that you're going to hear from, you're going to hear sort of a, a building block of a story where they started with their data, worked with their partners, built out a plan, and then began implementing. Um, and so here are some examples of some public, public use data sets that our states used. And then here are also some proprietary use data sets um, that our states um, were able to get some access to through their partnerships. And then um, here are some quality improvement programs and accountability measures um, that were also fruitful in um, contributing to our state level work, as well as on technical assistance opportunities um, for the states through the breast cancer learning community. So our learning community is really formulated by gathering um, two or more states together um, to look at a state level public health uh, related issue and um, sort of see how the states are currently demonstrating their partnerships throughout their state to move forward um, any given priority. And really to do that, um, our organization first really started with some questions to consider. And so here on the screen are just some examples um, we wanted to pass along to you all who are listening into the webinar today of um, at the end of this webinar, or maybe you all are already um, working with some partners to address breast cancer disparities, here are some questions that you all can consider um, to drive some discussions and conversations with your partners um, during some in-person meetings or virtual meetings, um, just as you're navigating the best way to sort of gather and analyze your information. Um, that's really the place where we started with our breast cancer learning community states, um, and we found that it was not only helpful and identifying what best data sources to utilize, but also within what context are we framing the data that we're gathering in order to now move into a position to be ready to do some action planning with our partners. And so it's really creating a seat at the table and identifying what role all of these different partners play. So what you'll hear from today is not only 
the role that the state public health department plays in addressing breast cancer disparities in general at a state level, but how they convene their state level partners throughout the state to help galvanize um, some additional support to move the needle even further. So you'll hear um, from our states on how they looked at not only within their state health agency, what partners they had there, but also how they possibly engaged um, you know, health IT partners, their payer partners through insurance, and then other community level partners, rather it be the hospital or the clinics, FQHCs, other local health departments on how they work together um, to, to move forward. And really, we look at that as an opportunity to leverage all of these different funding streams across these different partners so that we're all moving in the same direction towards the same goal, but we're all doing that within sort of um, a, a concerted effort that's outlined um, based on our funding. And so it was really helpful to have all of these different partners in the room not only when the states were gathering data and reporting out what their data was showing them, but also when it came time to do some action planning to hear from those other partners what were some things they were already doing and addressing um, that was related um, to, to this project work. And so um, here on the slide, I just wanted to be able to um, share with you all um, one of the reports that we found was very beneficial for the states to look at as an example of ways to communicate their story, um, not only to their partners they've been working with, but also um, to state representatives and other leaders across the state in order to protect funding that would help move their action plan further. Um, and I will wrap up just by saying this entire um, two years of work that we've been doing with our breast cancer learning community state really has taken a village um, so I would be remiss not to mention and acknowledge all of the wonderful colleagues I've been able to partner with on this work and just conceptualize this entire um, sort of learning community model so that it best fits for what our states really needed. And so in addition to our states that are represented on the call today that we'll be presenting, uh, we thank them so much, not only just for their time today, but over the course of the two years and all the wonderful work they've been doing, but also um, to my colleagues on the ASTO team, um, our consultants that have been very instrumental um, in this work, not just with the learning community, but also building out resources um, and other technical assistance tools for the states throughout. And then, of course, our funders, um, the CDC Division of Cancer Prevention and Control Team. Uh, we certainly could not have done any of this work without you all. And so um, before we turn it over to the states, I um, want to um, turn it over to Erica, who wants to share a few remarks with you all before we dive in um, to the state learning team. Erica? Erica? Yes, thank you, Alicia, um, for that nice overview of the learning community. Um, at this time, I just wanted to briefly give an, a little background on why CDC wanted to undertake this project. So eliminating the persistent gap in breast cancer mortality rates between black and white women is a goal for our division and the nation. And our statistics demonstrate that despite the significant progress in breast cancer detection and treatment, Overall, black women have a 41% higher breast cancer death rate than white women. And at the state level, we found significant variation in death rates as well. Nationally, on average, for every 100 breast cancer cases diagnosed, black women had nine more deaths than white women. And over time, the disparity in breast cancer mortality between black and white women has widened, which really highlights the fact that different approaches may be needed to identify and address inequalities in access to high quality health care from screening and early detection to treatment and long-term survival. And so as Alicia mentioned, um, in 2015, we initiated a collaboration with ASTO to address breast cancer mortality at the state level. We worked with the three states that you'll hear from today where the fatality from breast cancer for black women was equal to or above the national average. And the purpose of this study was to strengthen their ability to mobilize data resources more effectively to address disparities in breast cancer mortality. And as Alicia mentioned, because this project was to be data-driven, states were not limited to tackling just black-white differences, 
but also inequities by rural urban residents, insurance status, and socioeconomic status that they identified in their data. And the main goal was for states to take advantage of advances in the utility epi data, such as population-based cancer registries, using tools such as GIS mapping and outcomes linked data sets to identify the disparities and use the findings to help decision makers establish priorities. We also wanted this project to support our grantees in using high quality data more efficiently to monitor the impact of breast cancer prevention and control activities within the states. And finally, non-participating health departments can use this project as a model to improve the use of public health data to address cancer disparities. And so, as I mentioned during today's webinar, you'll hear presentations from all three state teams on their efforts to effectively translate data into cancer control activities to move the needle towards health equity. And our hope is that you will find this information useful for your efforts that you're undertaking in your state or community. And we thank you for your participation. And now I'll turn it back over to Alicia and Josh. Great, thanks so much, Erica. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our first state um, team to share their um, lessons and stories, um, the Arizona team. Uh, Virginia Warren, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Alicia. Um, here in Arizona, we have Virginia Warren and Emily Wozniak presenting. Emily is the Operations Manager for Cancer Prevention and Control, and Virginia is the uh, Office Chief for Cancer Prevention and Control. First, we're going to give an overview of the state. I know all of us believe our states are very unique and different, and that's the truth. Not an exception here. We'll talk about the year one ASTO project data and go over that quickly and discuss lessons learned from year one. Um, there were some lessons learned. It wasn't what we expected. And then we will talk about the current goals for year two. So Emily. Hello everyone, thank you for being on the webinar today. We're excited to share our data with you and our findings with you. This really was truly a wonderful collaborative project. Um, to give a quick overview of our state, uh, we have 15 large counties, so we're very different from some of those states on the East Coast um, that have those many counties that are smaller and closer together. We have very vast, um, expansive land out here. Um, the majority of our population does live in Maricopa County, which is where Phoenix is located, and Pima County, which um, um, has T Tucson, the city of Tucson. Uh, we also have a very racially and ethnically diverse population, as you can see from the chart on the slide. Um, because of this data, we were um, interested in expanding the project to not only compare the data between white non-Hispanic women and African-American women, but to also include Hispanic women in our state and A American Indian women. So ASTRO was generous enough to allow us to do that. So you'll see um, those four racial ethnic groups included in all of our data slides. Here's a quick map to just show you um, how expansive our 15 counties are. You can see Maricopa County in the pink um, and Pima County in the blue, again, that's where 80% um, of our state population lives. On this next map, you'll see where our tribal lands and reservations are located. And along the left-hand side, you can see a full list of our tribal communities. These are key partners of ours that we work with very closely here in Arizona, um, and for good reason. We, we have a lot of collaborative efforts with them, and this project was no exception. Okay. When we were approached with this issue and ASTO told us about what was going on, that women of color have a lower incidence but a higher breast cancer mortality rate here in Arizona, we gathered together a group and thought about it and said, well, why would that be? Well, our assumption was it was a screening issue, that these women must not be getting screened. Well, we do a lot of screening, so I guess we were thinking from our perspective of screening all the time. And what we found was that that was not the case. Um, you see on this slide that the screening rates within the past year that the um, 
African American women had a higher screening rate than the white non-Hispanic women. So did uh, American Indian women and Hispanic women. So um, with the, when you look at screening within the past two years, and of course this is birth data, and I know some folks are uncomfortable with birth data or have questions about it, but this is how we started to look at the issue. And you can see that within the past two years, again, the white non-Hispanic population had a lower screening rate. So um, after looking at this, we decided to look at it differently. And while these screening rates are different, and you can see if you're looking at in the past two years for women 40 and above, that the American Indian population and Hispanic population um, had a little bit lower screening rate than African American and white non-Hispanic, but the highest screening rate, according to Burfus, was with African American population. So when we looked at that, and we looked back at our hypothesis that it was a screening issue, we had to admit we were wrong. And we had to think about, okay, what are we going to look at now? What data do we look at now to determine um, what is the issue because from our findings, it absolutely was not screening. Emily? All right, so we went to our friends over at the Arizona Cancer Registry, and we talked with them about um, some different data points to pull and to dive a little deeper into the registry data. Um, in doing that, we found a few things, and those um, main findings are summarized here on your screen. The first finding was that women of color are diagnosed at a median age of seven years younger than white non-Hispanic women in our state. In addition, they're also diagnosed with more aggressive cancer types. So we looked at tumor typing of the breast cancer diagnoses in Arizona, and women of color had um, a higher rate of triple negative cancers, for example, which are, as you know, more aggressive. We also looked at the time from diagnosis into treatment, so when women were starting their cancer treatment, and we did not see any significant differences among the various uh, racial and ethnic groups. So I'm not going to walk through every single data point, but I'll highlight a few things for you. So this first graph um, takes a look at all female breast cancer cases by race, ethnicity, and age from the years 2010 to 2013. Um, this is Statewide data, it's the percent of cases by race ethnicity, so you'll see that legend on the bottom. Um, I wanted to point out here that in the age bracket 30 to 39 years, we can see that the red bar and the green bar, which represent white Hispanic women and black women respectively, are higher than our other racial ethnic groups. Um, so that was the key data finding that we wanted to point out on this graph. Um, and as you can see, as we get older, um, there are differences. Um, women 65 years and older, the highest uh, racial group was white non-Hispanic women. All right, this chart just breaks down our, our first key finding and takes a look at the median age of diagnosis by race and ethnicity. You can see that white non-Hispanic women had a median age of diagnosis of 64 years, while white Hispanic women were diagnosed a median age of 57, black women 58 years, and American Indian women 57 years. All right, on this next graph, we are looking at all female breast cancer from the years 2010 to 2013. Um, this is by race ethnicity, um, by days of, from diagnosis to their first course of treatment. So again, this is statewide data. Um, it's looking at race ethnicities um, on the bottom. You can see the legend there. Um, what we wanted to point out on this chart um, is that really we didn't see many r real true differences in um, the time from diagnosis to treatment initiation um, from the 0 to 29 day group, 30 to 59 days, and 60 to 89 days. However, in the 90 and more days, so this means that um, when women were first diagnosed, it took them greater than 90 days to initiate treatment. We do see that purple bar pop out at us, and that represents the American Indian population. All right, on this next chart, we're looking at invasive female breast cancer from 2010 to 2013 again. This is race ethnicity by different tumor types. 
So by estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 combination results. Um, and this is by state um, data, so please excuse um, the county groups, that's an error. This is statewide data. Um, wanted to point out here, under the triple negative category, we do see the African American bar pop out at us, um, which represents a higher proportion of, of African American women being diagnosed with a triple negative um, diagnosis. All right, so lessons learned from year one. Arizona's women of color are diagnosed with breast cancer at a median age of seven years younger than non-Hispanic whites. Um, when diagnosed with breast cancer, their tumor types are more aggressive. So with a stakeholder group that came together to work with us and to discuss these findings and to really they directed us down different pathways to continue our research, um, we've decided for the state of Arizona it is not feasible for this population to be screened using the USPSTF guidelines beginning at age 50. Um, we are not doing that in our programs, our health plans are not doing that, and it's not a step that's been taken in Arizona. So to sum up year one activities, we analyzed a lot of data. We brought together key stakeholders that really became quite passionate about the project and about working with us in an ongoing manner. We compiled the data into a report, convened partners, um, and shared the findings, which I think that sounds trite, but that's very important. Sharing the findings and continuing the discussion um, is key to people taking action, and not just here at the agency, but our partners outside of the agency. We also created an action plan collaboratively with our pro project partners, and this slide shows you an a very lengthy list of project partners uh, that continue to work with us today. Um, they followed us into year two, and they're continuing to work with us. The next slide is a report we produced for the state that um, pulls together all the data into one document. This has actually gone through two printings because we ran out. Uh, it was in higher demand than what we thought, we didn't print enough, and now we just have a handful left in the office. Uh, it's been used broadly. So for year two, we looked at continuing those partnerships so that we can, can continue to increase screening rates. And one of the areas of focus became the federally qualified community health centers here in Arizona. So we are standing members of a quality improvement committee and we'll get into detail with that, but you each have a primary care association in your state, and they have a quality improvement committee working on different um, initiatives with it for all of their members. We also are looking at the potential to have a project ECHO that is focused on breast cancer in the state of Arizona, and that would increase access to high quality screening, diagnostic management, and cancer care across the state. And we really have, the bottom line is to enhance the capacity of rural providers in a highly rural state. In Arizona, there are 22 FQHCs. They have their monthly quality improvement meeting through the Arizona Alliance for Community Health Centers. So now we sit in and participate in each of those meetings. The reports um, are really, they're giving us monthly reports on screening rates. So I see colorectal, breast, and cervical cancer screening rates, plus HPV immunization rates for each FQHC in the state of Arizona every month. So the report card is very interesting, but the report card and their screening rates are really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, they need to learn how to improve their data capture within the EHR. They're learning to implement evidence-based initiatives and how to become comfortable with the community guide. Um, implementing the uh, evidence-based initiatives really takes a lot of thought in using a purposeful quality improvement process. And so those are the things we're teaching them within that committee process. Um, and really, 
working with the FQHCs on that Quality Improvement Committee is based on the partnerships we've created over time. In Project ECHO, we're working with New Mexico and partners to see if we can create a breast cancer hub in Arizona. We were looking at Komen and the U of A Cancer Center at St. Joseph's as potential places to have that hub. As of July 31st, Arizona no longer has a Komen affiliate. They have closed. We're also reaching out to FQHCs and primary care providers all across the state so that we can partner to enhance the capacity of providers at the rural area. And staff from ADHS will be attending the training in New Mexico probably in September. Now, Emily and I are just primary points of contact here at ADHS, but I will tell you that with Project ECHO, the partnerships that we created have allowed us to continue some amazing work, to tell you the truth. Um, for example, when Coleman closed, it creates a gap for access to treatment in the state of Arizona. It's a significant gap because Coleman provided quite a few treatment funds to support women who were not insured and not eligible for Medicaid. So we pulled together the same group of partners, the same group of stakeholders for a meeting to discuss closing the gap. And they responded promptly and quickly. And it's because we started this work together, we're continuing to work together. The power of the partnerships in year two has really uh, been a great asset to the state and will be to the women of the state of Arizona. So thank you very much. That wraps it up for Arizona. Thank you so much, Virginia and Emily, for uh, getting us started with this afternoon's state presentations. Um, moving us along, I would like to turn the floor now to Kelly Luskin and her colleagues with her uh, representing the Tennessee Department of Health. Kelly, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Josh. So good afternoon. Um, I serve as the Director of Reproductive and Women's Health here with the Tennessee Department of Health, where I oversee the Tennessee Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening Program. Um, today, Fred Kroom and Audrey Bauer, both who are epidemiologists, are going to be co-presenting with me. Um, Fred works um, in the Office of Healthcare Statistics, and Audrey works in my section within Reproductive and Women's Health. Um, so first, I just want to thank ASTO for the opportunity to participate in the breast cancer learning community and for all of the technical assistance that they've provided over the last couple of years. And I also want to thank um, the rest of the internal team here at Tennessee Department of Health and our external stakeholders. Um, I think, as Arizona said, um, we definitely couldn't have done this work without them. Um, huge contribution to what we learned over these last two years. So during uh, the first year of this project, in fiscal year 2013, we took a deep dive into the data and pulled together all of the possible data resources that could possibly help tell the story of the state of breast cancer in Tennessee. Uh, and doing this allowed us to focus our attention on the area with the greatest disparity with plans to apply the knowledge learned um, from that area across the state. We kicked off the second year with a stakeholder meeting in our target area of Memphis. And during this meeting, two main themes arose that the stakeholders felt were the biggest issues leading to the disparities in Memphis, uh, one being transportation barriers and two being patient navigation services. So we initially brainstormed uh, the idea of funding some transportation efforts with the voucher system but quickly realized that that effort would not be sustainable long term. So therefore, we looked to existing resources, such as our mobile mammography units. And fortunately, they were at the table with us and willing to share their data. And their data allowed us to assess where they were going in the county and map the women that were being served based on zip code. So as for initial ideas that were suggested related to patient navigation services, we found that there were already tremendous efforts going on in the county. And therefore, we decided to work with Dr. Martin with the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, who is already interested in investigating navigation services. 
So to set the stage, at the beginning of the project, we knew that breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer and the second leading cause of cancer deaths among women in Tennessee. And we knew that although breast cancer incidence is similar among black women and white women in Tennessee, black women are more likely to die from the disease. Now Fred is going to walk you through the first year of data analysis and map creation. And then Audrey is going to discuss how we compiled the data so that we could further focus our efforts in the areas of highest need. Okay, so in um, year one, there was a very strong emphasis on using GIS or geographic information systems to map um, geographic disparity across the state. So I immediately got together with the director of our cancer registry, Martin Whiteside, and we started pulling data on incidence and mortality. Actually, we used biostatistics death data for the mortality. We also used uh, cancer surveillance data to pull regional and distant stage cancers at time of diagnosis and also to calculate days from first diagnosis to first treatment, and finally we used some BRFSS data to look at screening rates, um, particularly among women 40 and over. Um, I also backed up the maps with spatial analysis, basically hotspot analysis, to, to look, give some statistical um, support to the geographic disparities. And finally, we mapped various facilities, including Commission on Cancer accredited hospitals, and did various drive times to look for um, service area coverage. So um, next slide. So our major findings were we found the highest rates of breast cancer mortality in northwest, southwest Tennessee, and Shelby County. Shelby County basically comprises the city of Memphis, which is our largest city, so that's a very significant contrib contribution. The highest rate of late stage disease was in southwest Tennessee and again Shelby County. The highest mortality rates among African American women were also northwest Tennessee, southwest Tennessee, and Shelby County and drive time analysis showed large gaps in access to commission on cancer approved hospitals. So the first thing we looked at were incidence and mortality, and I put them side by side so you could look at the, the relative differences. And the first thing we kind of noticed with incidence is there are kind of three sort of hot spots, sort of an east, middle, and west across the state. But when you look at mortality, you really see a more significant hot spot in west Tennessee. There's sort of a little line going through the middle of the state, but we're kind of focusing our attention on west Tennessee now. So then we wanted to look at the bigger picture. We did a regional map, and we have 14 health department regions in Tennessee, eight rural and six metros. Of course, Shelby County would be one of the metros. And again, you can see there's almost a polarity from west to east, West Tennessee really standing out with higher rates of mortality. And then finally, um, oh, I'm sorry, next to last. Uh, we looked at late stage diagnosis. Again, Southwest and Shelby sort of stand out. Northwest kind of falls out. We're not sure why. So we're thinking about focusing our attention on either south, south, well, definitely Shelby County and maybe Southwest, although the demographics are highly different. Southwest Tennessee is much more rural. And then finally, we looked at racial disparities. Again, I put white and African American side by side, and these are just mortality. And you can see African Americans across the board tend to be a little higher, but again, the western county, the western regions in Shelby County are really standing out. So then, um, year two, I'll pass it on to Audrey. Hey everyone. Um, as Kelly mentioned, as we um, moved into phase two of our project, um, we decided to focus on western Tennessee, especially Shelby County uh, and Memphis. Um, and so we had an initial stakeholders meeting, and um, a lot of ideas were thrown around. Again, Kelly said that there was a lot of concern about um, transportation and navigation. Um, and so after that first stakeholder meeting, when we came back to the office, we kind of started thinking about you know, what else could we do with this data to help um, inform the stakeholders, inform the discussions that, that were being had, um, especially as it result, as it revolves around transportation issues. And so we kind of thought about it and played with the data quite a bit. And what we ended up doing is um, looking at data at the zip code level um, and trying to compare breast cancer risk um, to um, mammography service delivery. And luckily, because um, Memphis, Shelby County is one of our larger counties, we had sort of enough data that we were able to, to drill down to zip code level. So we looked at four um, breast cancer, um, four measures of breast cancer risk. Um, breast cancer incidence, mortality, um, and rates of poverty and uninsured um, among women uh, by zip code in Shelby County. And we focused mostly on women 40 and older. Um, that's the population of, 
our target population for our Tennessee State Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening Program. So we mapped those all individually, and then we also took all four measures, and we combined them into a single weighted uh, risk score for each zip code. And then we divided that into three risk groups, high, medium, and low, um, and mapped those as well. The second part um, of the analysis was to look at service delivery, mammogram service delivery. And so we had three sources of data. We had the location of brick and mortar uh, mammogram facilities. Um, we had data on the location volume of mobile mammography services. Um, those came from Baptist and Methodist healthcare systems in Shelby. Um, they were um, some of the stakeholders at that initial meeting and they agreed to share that data with us. And then we also had data on the location volume of Tennessee breast and cervical screening program services, so our state screening program data. And we took all those data, um, screening um, mammography data, and we superimposed those. Um, can you go back a couple slides? Not there yet. <laughs> Thanks. Two more. There you go. Um, so basically, um, we took that service data and we superimposed it on um, the risk data to see if we could identify um, any, area, any areas that were sort of underserved but high risk. All right, next slide. All right. So um, I don't, again, we, we only have 15 minutes. I don't have time to go through all the slides, but I, I chose a couple that I thought were illustrative um, of what we did. So again, um, the blue on the map shows the risk scores that were determined to do this process. So the um, dark blue is high risk, the medium blue is moderate risk, and the light blue is low risk. And this is a map of Shelby County, and the city of Memphis makes up the majority of sort of the southwestern part of the county. And so superimposed on that, the red dots are the brick and mortar um, mammography facilities. So it's pretty apparent to see that there aren't a lot of um, mammogram facilities in those high-risk areas. So when our stakeholders are saying that transportation was an issue, that access was, a, was an issue, that kind of supports um, what they said, a lot of women in these high-risk areas have to travel all the way to the other side of the city in order to get a mammogram. Next slide. And then the other slide that I wanted to share, again, the blue is the same risk scores. And now it's superimposed on that is the um, mobile mammography um, data. So um, each circle um, represents a certain number of mammograms that were performed in each county. And so the larger and darker the circle, the more mammograms that were performed. And again, um, the high-risk areas aren't necessarily, the mobile units aren't necessarily going to those high-risk areas. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the mobile man unit activity is, is happening in the, the low and moderate-risk areas. Um, and I guess this was a little surprising to us. I, for some reason in our minds, I think we thought of the mobile units as being, the purpose is to go to those high-risk, underserved areas. Um, but talking to the stakeholders and the hospital systems, like that's not necessarily where they target those mammogram units. Um, they often go, for example, to workplaces whose employees have health insurance, for example. Um, so that was, kind of, that was kind of interesting to us. Um, and one of the health systems that we, that we worked at and that we got data from actually took this map and went back and started um, developing some partnerships in those high-risk areas and scheduling those mammogram um, mobile units to actually go to those high-risk units that they hadn't previously been going to. So um, that was really helpful to sort of inform that activity. So um, that's what I got. <clears throat> to summarize our accomplishments, um, I think the first thing I want to point out is the building of the strong relationships with our part, with our stakeholders that were formed over the last couple of years. As Arizona mentioned, um, that was hugely invaluable to this process. Um, and presenting the data that we were finding all along the way and keeping them informed of the data was hugely guided the process as well and helped us leverage um, how we were going to utilize that data to drive efforts um, in that region. So the second year, as I said, we continue to build on existing data and further um, analyze each additional layer that we add on as Audrey just recently um, described. 
And they've also utilized, um, the stakeholders in Memphis were able to utilize the data to strategically position the mobile mammography sites, as Audrey also just mentioned. And, we will, and they've utilized the data to inform policy um, in Memphis as well. And currently, the Tennessee Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening Program is working to create a vendor agreement with the mobile mammography units <clears throat> in Memphis that hopes we hope to particularly take this across the entire state. Um, as we were, as Audrey mentioned, we were surprised to find out that they're not necessarily going to, out to the areas of higher risk. Um, so currently we've contracted with Dr. White Means at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center to conduct a gap analysis to compile existing assessment documents. <coughs> Survey 100 women and breast cancer survivors from the community, conduct focus groups with providers, and then develop GIS maps that further define the gaps. We're also working with Dr. Martin at UT Health Science Center to disseminate a patient navigation survey to better understand and highlight the state of patient navigation for breast cancer from outreach to screening to follow-up care and treatment and on through survivorship. So the plan is to continue this project and presentation of findings as we move through the process to the Memphis, um, through the Memphis Breast Cancer Consortium. And this is an organized group of local stakeholders in Memphis that are passionate about addressing the disparities that exist in Memphis and Shelby County. And this group was actually formed in January of 2016 after the National Avon study came out in 2014. Um, and like I said, we, we focused our efforts in on Shelby County, but we hope to take all the lessons learned from this project and apply it across the state. So thank you. And this, this last slide just um, includes everybody from the team here at Tennessee Department of Health that has contributed to this project along the way. So again, I just want to thank them for all of their um, help and support throughout this process. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly, Fred, and Aubrey. Um, your presentation uh, was wonderful. Um, and finally, we have the opportunity now to hear from Denise Smith, who is the Director of Perinatal Programs at the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources Bureau of Public Health. Denise, thank you for joining the webinar. The floor is yours. Thank you. And West Virginia would like to start also by thanking the AFSTO team for their support in this opportunity uh, that we've had the last two years. The learning community is based within the Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening Program in West Virginia. And the West Virginia program was one of the first programs in the nation and it has a strong history of uh, performance. Before I present on the West Virginia breast cancer community, I wanted to share a little bit about West Virginia. West Virginia is the only state located entirely within the Appalachian region. It's the second most rural state in the nation. The population is just over 1.8 million with a median household income of 41,000 per year. West Virginia is very racially and ethnically homogeneous. 97% of our population classifies white, 4% African American, and 2% other races. Only 1.5% identify as Hispanic. The most rural of West Virginians live no more than 30 minutes from their place of birth. Communities consist of their families or branches of their families, with two-thirds of the population living in areas with less than 2,500 people. The Appalachian culture is overall very mistrusting of modern medicine. Most are very reluctant to enter the mainstream medical system. And most rural West Virginia don't live, identify with those folks that live in town. There's a high concentration of underinsured and elderly, and most communities are dependent on a single industry. 
such as coal mining, which is rapidly disappearing here. But as you can see, with all of the negative things that I've said about West Virginia, it's all a very beautiful state. We have a strong value system, are patriotic, and come from close-knit families with a modest sense of self. Now to get into the breast cancer burden in the state. Breast cancer is the most diagnosed cancer and the second leading cause of cancer death in West Virginia women. Each year, approximately 1,405 women are diagnosed and 288 women die of breast cancer. And over half of the women in breast cancer with West Virginia are lo diagnosed with localized breast cancer. This slide was created from, by our epidemiologist to show the burden of cancer in West Virginia from our diagnosis rates from 2005 and 2009 and then 2008 to 2012. Again, this slide continues to show uh, for patients that have received late diagnosis, their approximate age group, and where they've lived. For this project, we chose to look at our data, and we went with one of the areas that had the highest uh, or the lowest, I mean, rate of screening and uh, higher number of days from diagnosis to treatment. And these are Calhoun and Gilmer counties in the center of the state, and it's a very rural area. This slide shows some of our GIS mapping where the darker color has the higher mortality incident rates, and then they were mostly concentrated in the eastern central part of the state, but then there's some outliers scattered throughout. This is a map, the darker color here, showing 90 days from treatment to diagnosis by county. And this data is showing the female breast cancer by county with a higher percentage over here in the eastern portion of the mountains. This showed cancer, breast cancer in the women by poverty areas. And again, most of those are down in the southern coal fields. This is a list of our partners. One thing that this project allowed us to do was to bring all of the payer sources together and share data. The managed care organizations, Medicaid, uh, all came to the table and were interested and willing to supply data to show to how we can address this. Our action plan for the next year, we would like to expand to additional sites using the same data parameters that were set in year two. And we'd like to promote the breast cancer learning community or the ECHO for our rural health care providers. Charleston Area Medical Center, one of our COC hospitals, has um, become an ECHO hub site for West Virginia. We'd like to provide additional op educational opportunities to health care providers on how to improve survivorship care at the local rural level and address some of the barriers that were identified in the patient surveys. From the um, patient surveys at Mini Hamilton, these are just a few of the results. We had our provider health site in Calhoun and Gilmer counties many Camelton Health Systems. They had two locations. We mailed surveys to the women to see what their barriers were and their history of mammography. We received 118 back and 96 reported that they had received a mammogram in the last year and that getting a mammogram was easy for them. We also, I can go back, sorry. Um, 
12% cited no health insurance as the reason for not getting a mammogram, 8% said they didn't have money, 3% time, and only surprisingly, only 3% cited transportation issues as a concern. Some of our successes was acquiring the GIS software and training. We had some uh, a slow start due to some delays, delays in receiving the GIS software, but we've had a huge success in getting representatives, like I said, from the multiple payer sources to meet and share data. And the CAMC Project ECHO is the first breast cancer ECHO in the state. They were going to have their first ECHO session in early September. And the, a little bit about our funding, and there's my contact information if anyone has additional questions. And that's all. All right, well, all right thank, you, yeah, thank you so much, Denise, uh, for your pre presentation, and thanks again to the, uh, to the Arizona and Tennessee teams who were able to join us and provide us with some really in-depth information as well. So now we will move along to the uh, open uh, Q&A session uh, of this afternoon's webinar. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, uh, please type it in the chat box located on your screen. Uh, we will start the Q&A session by going through uh, some questions that folks have submitted to us already through the chat box. So thank you again for, uh, for using that chat box feature. And as a reminder, phone lines will be muted for the duration of this webinar. So we will be taking questions exclusively uh, through the chat box. Before I, I turn a question over uh, to our state teams joining the line this afternoon, I would like to uh, address a logistics question that folks have been asking. And uh, I do want to remind everybody that we will be making uh, slides and recording of this afternoon's webinar available to you on our ASTO breast cancer website. And we'll let you know the webpage for that later on this afternoon. And also we'll be sending those to you via email if you have uh, registered to be a participant of this afternoon's webinar. So thanks for your interest in, in our slides and in the webinar this afternoon. So moving on to some of the questions that we've been gathering through the chat box, um, I would like to pose a question first to the Arizona team, uh, but I would like to get some insight from the Tennessee and West Virginia teams as well. Uh, someone has asked us, uh, what uh, meeting formats do you use uh, to engage the high number of project partners? Uh, Virginia or Emily, can you uh, provide us some insight on that question? Sure, sure, Josh. Um, what we did in Arizona is before the stakeholders meeting, we shared some of our um, information, the data, uh, the findings basically, with a small group. And the small group was really um, surprised at the findings. And they were able to generate lists of names of people they wanted to invite. So it was basically pulling together, weaving together partners from multiple organizations that ended up in having, you know, the result was we had a very large stakeholders group come together. Actually, it was too big for the first room, so we got a bigger room. Um, it was really standing room only. And so we used that process of turning to our partners, asking them to bring their partners to the table, and that happened across the state. Um, tribal partners were included in that. So we had a great rep representation of all the groups that we were studying. And that process continues even today. For the meeting, we're having to address the Komen issue um, or lack of Komen issue. Um, again, it's standing room only. And we just turned to partners and the stakeholders group. And then they've brought more people to the table. So it's really relying on your partners to do some of your recruiting. Terrific. Thank you, Virginia. Kelly, do you have anything to add about how you've been uh, working with your partners? I was just going to add to Arizona in that um, we did a combination to a face-to-face -face meetings and conference calls. I would say one of the things that was a little bit challenging with the stakeholder meetings, challenging and beneficial at the same time, is that it seemed like every time we would have a meeting, there would be a lot of new faces there at the table, which is great because then you're adding on ideas. But then, of course, that tends to tweak the direction of your project each time as well. Um, so that was a benefit and both a challenge at the same time. And a 
in a project that you're trying to work on in a short time frame. Um, but obviously moving forward and looking at the big picture long term, that's hugely beneficial to have continuing ideas and continuing eyes looking in on the project. Terrific. Thanks, Kelly. Denise, do you have anything to add? No, I think they, they pretty well covered everything that we've done here in West Virginia. I think West Virginia has a strong history of collaborative efforts because everybody, it's a, being a poor state, we've had to rely on everybody coming to the table and bringing small pots of funding to move projects forward. So that's helped us a lot, just having that history. Sure. Thanks, Denise. So the next question I'd like to pose to the group um, concerns community health workers. We have a couple questions on community health workers, and I'd like to pose this initially first to, uh, to Kelly or to someone on the Tennessee team. Uh, specifically in Shelby County, um, are there still an active group of community health workers that have been uh, working with the community to raise awareness and to help in uh, navigation and breast cancer screening? Yes, there are several different um, groups that actually have community health workers that are doing efforts in the communities. And that's one of the things that we kept finding at our stakeholder meetings. Every time we would kind of come up with an idea of something to do or a project that we really wanted to work on, someone else with the table would mention, oh, so-and-so over here is already doing that, um, which is great. There's a lot of efforts already going on. And that was part of the reason that um, leveraged us or pushed us towards moving forward with a gap analysis is I think there's a lot of effort and resources, but we're not all working together necessarily and leveraging our efforts and resources to the best of our ability. Um, and another thing is that also led to why we wanted to do the navigation survey is to be able to assess what actually is being done with the community health workers and navigators um, across the state of Tennessee and particularly in Shelby County so that we can see what's working well and what isn't working so well, and so that they can begin to learn from each other. Yeah, thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, Denise, have, uh, has West Virginia been um, tapping into community health workers at all as part of your efforts in the learning community? Not within the learning community, no. Sure, thanks, Denise. And uh, Virginia, same question to you. Has Arizona been using community health workers? We're not using community health workers except at one FQHC that is located closer to the border. Actually, two FQHCs are located closer to the border, but it's not statewide. Got it. Thank you. Uh, the next question I'd like to pose to the group uh, concerns the process that, that states have been using in identifying disparities and using that to inform different interventions. Um, how did states determine if a disparity was significant? Did you use a particular statistical cutoff, or what was considered uh, significant? Uh, Denise in West Virginia, do you have any, any thoughts on how you've been identifying which disparities are worth uh, addressing? Um, I was not involved in the project when we were using the data to select specific our pilot site, um, so I really couldn't stress that. I'm not sure if Steve Blankenship, our epidemiologist for the project, is still on, and perhaps he could address that. But um, I really am not familiar with that part of the project. Sure, no problem, Denise. Perhaps we can follow up uh, later on that topic. Uh, Kelly and, and the rest of the Tennessee folks, do you have any insights on, on sort of how you determine which disparities were worth addressing? We, I think we, we kind of went with the maps. We started out with the GIS, and it just kind of worked for us. So we kind of continued that into year two. So I, I, did do some, I didn't include my maps here. I did some statistical and spatial analysis, and it just sort of confirmed what we saw. So it was more of a general gestalt kind of process. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Fred. And uh, Virginia and Emily, do you have anything to add about um, how Arizona used data to identify disparities? Yes. Um, we, if anything fell outside of the state confidence interval in comparison, then it was significant, and it's a 5% confidence interval. 
All right, thanks, Virginia. I also wanted to uh, loop in my colleague, Alicia, uh, to see if she has any insights from an ASTO perspective as well. Alicia? Yeah, sure. So um, really looking at the data is um, what built the parameters. So we really just allowed the data that our states were collecting and gathering and analyzing to um, sort of guide and order their footsteps, so to speak, um, through this project. And so um, when we were able to sort of identify what the hot spots were, for example, um, then it gave us an opportunity through the engagement of each of the state stakeholder teams to now look at the demographics of those areas and sort of see who was included. Um, as far as getting down to age group, um, the claims data from the payer partners that were involved in the state um, um, in the state work was also very beneficial um, and helped um, us and the state teams to identify the um, target populations and which disparities um, to address. Josh, this is Denise from West Virginia. As usual, sure. with our, my, the epi for this project, Steve Blankenship, had my back and he typed in that we used, uh, the project was based on high mortality and low screening rates as the main deciding factors and then the FQHC Oh, that was willing to participate in the project. Well, thanks, Denise, for bringing that to our attention, and thanks, Stephen, for staying on the ball and, and giving us that insight. Um, the next question I also want to turn back to my colleague, Alicia, as far as a uh, logistical learning community type of inquiry. Alicia, will ASTO be expanding uh, this program beyond the, the three states that we have joining us this afternoon? Um, thanks, Josh. Well, Unfortunately, we do not have access to an unlimited amount of funds because as an organization, we would certainly love to do that. Um, and if we had um, a blank check, that's exactly what we would be doing. However, what we have been able to do throughout this two years is to collect all of the lessons learned um, and all of the um, dirty details, if you will, um, of what the states have been doing when it comes to where did they start, how did they do it, who did they engage, how did they engage them, what roles did all the stakeholders play, and what resources and other strategies are available. Uh, we've gathered all of that into um, the Breast Cancer Online Toolkit that everyone on this webinar and beyond um, will have access to. So before we wrap up today, um, we, uh, Josh will be doing sort of an overview um, of that site, which is live now. And then I also saw in the chat box a question related to project funding. Um, we were able to um, provide each of the state teams um, with um, some funding um, to help with this work. And then um, as much as we could, we really wanted to align their action plan activities related to this grant funding um, to some of the existing um, work plan objectives that they already had outlined across their breast and cervical cancer work where it made sense so that we were able to leverage resources there. Um, so across the three teams, I think the funding levels may be slightly different, um, but they were able to receive um, a, a small stipend um, directly from ASTO to work on this breast cancer learning community work. Thanks, Alicia. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful information. Uh, the next question we have concerns uh, mobile, excuse me, mobile mammography partners, and I know that's been a key part of the work that West Virginia and Tennessee have done as part of the learning community. Uh, so Denise, can you start us off with and, um, letting us know um, what incentives you use to have mobile mammography partners on board and how you got their buy-in to the learning community? We, the uh, WVU, which is where Bonnie's best, the mobile mammography unit is housed, has always been a partner with the breast and cervical cancer screening program. So we really didn't have to offer a lot of incentive, you know, any type of incentive because they're always, we did provide some funding for them to go to 10 additional sites um, this year. But they are always looking for funding to be able to go to more sites, so it wasn't really an incentive because it helped with the project. Yeah, thanks, Denise. And uh, Kelly and the, the Tennessee team, same question. How have you uh, been getting a mobile, mo mobile mammography folks on board? 
And for us as well, we did not have any incentives for any of our stakeholders, honestly, to come to the table. These were people that are just invested on, in the issue um, and were highly motivated themselves to come and eager to share what they knew themselves um, so that we could learn from each other at the same time. So I guess Great, maybe the incentive is the ability to learn from each other. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, so the, the next question is, is specifically for Arizona, so I'd like to turn this one over to Virginia and Emily in Arizona. Uh, during your presentation, you discussed that you are no longer using uh, the U.S. Preventive, Serv Preventive Services Task Force recommendations of starting uh, breast cancer screening at age 50 based on the data you found. So uh, what has been your, uh, what recommendation have you been using instead? What's your new um, screening age and sort of how has that been implemented in Arizona? Thank you, Josh. Um, the guidance that we're following is we start screening at 40 for asymptomatic patients and we screen every year. We're not going every other year. And that's what our health plans are doing. Um, that's what we're doing in our breast and cervical program. Um, Obviously, from the data we found, we can't really wait till 50 to start, to start screening this population. And one of the ways we're using, one of the ways of changing this across the state for even non-contracted um, facilities is to make sure more and more people are aware of this so that if they get that younger patient with a lump, that they don't just think, oh, you're 29, this can't possibly happen to you. So we're doing a lot of provider education and distribution and dis dissemination of our report so people are aware that this is the finding in Arizona. And Virginia, um, this is Alicia. Sorry to put you a little bit on the spot, but if you could share a little bit of the detail on um, sort of exactly how you approached your partners in adjusting those um, age recommendations for um, screening and treatment. All right. So. Um, Emily has become an expert at presenting the data from the ASSO report, and she's done a terrific job. And so we had all of our, um, we requested that I think about a dozen different health plans participate in the meeting. We just invited them. They came. We presented the data, and they were like, whoa, we have to really stick to 40. And they shared that. And Really, one of them came back to us later who was a medical director at a very large health plan, and she said, we will not be changing away from screening at 40, not in Arizona. We need to keep it at 40. She was very clear that she discussed it, shared our report during a provider's meeting at the health plan, and they've, <clears throat> they've held it there. We've also shared our findings with that quality improvement committee um, that brings 22 FQHC quality managers together every month. Um, we've shared it repeatedly with them so that it has sunk in and they understand the importance of not, have, not letting a medical director sway their protocols to align with USPSTF. So we have kept the FQHCs at screening at 40 also and screening in an annual basis. So really it's a lot of education, education, and education again. Would you add anything to that, Emily? No, I don't think so. Okay. Does that help, Alicia? It certainly yes, did for me, Virginia. Thanks. Yeah, so thank you, Virginia. Um, the next question uh, we have uh, someone is asking, has there been a focus on survivorship and breast reconstruction rates as part of the learning community? I know, at least in West Virginia, uh, improving the care delivered to breast cancer survivors is a key focus of your action plan through Project ECHO. So, Denise, could you explain in a little more detail um, what it is uh, Project ECHO is going to be working on in your state? Sure, I'll try. Um, the Project ECHO with Charleston Area Medical Center, like I said, is CAMC is a uh, COC hospital, and they're fo focusing on survivorship care in the rural area because transportation is an issue. A lot of our counties do, do not have public transportation, and a lot of women can be followed with their primary care provider with the right support 
from the cancer center. So um, the cancer center wanted to be able to provide education and support for the rural health care provider on helping the women through survivorship if it's dealing with edema, uh, balance issues, side effects from chemo, cardiology issues. They wanted to be able to try to keep that woman the care in her community as much as possible. Does that answer your question? Yes, Denise, absolutely. Uh, just so I make sure I have this right, uh, Arizona and, and, and Tennessee teams, have you been uh, using your learning community efforts to look at survivorship or breast reconstruction? In Tennessee, we have not. In Arizona, we have not. We've used our contracted FQHCs for the breast and cervical program for that. Got it. Thank you both for elaborating. Uh, the next question uh, we have, I'd like to turn over to the Tennessee team to start, but I think hearing from all the state teams would be helpful. Um, has the use of GIS mapping uh, grown in your agency as a result of this learning community? Um, I've mapped a lot more cancer than I have in the past, that's for sure. Um, I'm not in the Office of Cancer Surveillance, so I occasionally do map the data, but not to this extent. Understood. Thanks, Fred. Uh, Virginia and Emily, uh, same question. Has your use of GIS mapping uh, expanded as a result of this learning community? Yeah, this is Emily. Absolutely. Um, when we started this project, uh, we had a member of our, of our team um, be trained in GIS, um, and then she has since left the agency, but other staff members, um, including our, our epidemiologists and our programs, um, have also been trained on GIS mapping. So it's been an incredible tool and resource for us um, here at the department. Thanks, Emily. And same question to Denise. I know this is more uh, Stephen Blankenship's area of expertise, but he did give us a yes in the chat box. So I wanted to see if you had anything to add from your perspective as sort of a team lead for West Virginia. I believe that not only are we use it in this project, but it's expanded to other programs within the Bureau using the GIS heat mapping to make decisions. It's definitely expanded. Well, terrific. Thanks, Denise, for that insight. Um, the next question, uh, this is directed specifically to the Arizona and Tennessee teams. Are uh, free and charitable clinics involved uh, in the project in those states? Uh, Virginia, is that the case in Arizona? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and Kelly, same to you in Tennessee. Have uh, free and charitable clinics been involved in the project? Yes. And Denise, is that, is that the case in West Virginia as well? Yes, it is. Great. So clearly the, that's one of the, the, the many partners you've all brought on board that have been able to make an impact uh, in this uh, learning community uh, to date. Um, Another question I'd like to put to the, to the group is on uh, GIS mapping. Someone is asking that uh, G GIS data is effective in, in spotlighting incidents and mortality data. Um, have any states used that in sort of a modeling context um, to look at what things might be looking like uh, in the next few years? Um, Tennessee team, has that been something that you've done as part of the learning community? Um, no, I'm, emer I'm familiar with emerging hotspots, and I don't think I have the software to do it, but I'd be interested in trying it if I got a free, uh, free trial or something. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, Denise, same question to you. Has that been something West Virginia has been doing or considering in terms of looking ahead for the next steps in the learning community? Um, not that I'm aware of, but that is something that we should, could certainly do. Great, and then same question to uh, the Arizona folks as well. You know, we have not used it for modeling for the future, but that is a great idea, Josh. Very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll agree with the, 
the person who posed that question, that's a good um, possible way uh, to look forward. We do have time uh, quickly for one final question before we move on to the conclusion uh, portion of the webinar. Uh, have any states uh, used a community uh, navigation program to close the gap between communities and FQHCs and other uh, healthcare providers, stakeholders? Has that been the case, Denise, in West Virginia? I'm not sure. Josh, um, not sure how to answer that. Let me think about that just a minute. Maybe you could come back to me. Sure. Uh, yeah, Virginia and Emily in, in Arizona, has, has Arizona used any sort of community navigation program to sort of tie up those loose ends between different stakeholders? No, not really, Josh. Um, in our breast and cervical cancer program, we do use patient navigation um, to kind of shorten that time from screening to diagnosis and diagnosis to treatment initiation. But um, regarding this project, no, not so much. Understood. Thanks, Emily. Uh, Kelly and the Tennessee team, have, have you utilized uh, that resource as part of your breast cancer control efforts? And I'm actually not familiar with the community navigation program per se. I think, I think the response to this from us would be there are several different um, people that are providing navigation all along the continuum of care of breast cancer. Um, and I think that's the big reason that we're wanting to do the navigation survey is to really assess what everybody is doing, like who is outreaching to people to get them in for screening, who is trying to navigate people from a diagnosis to treatment, you know, who's doing what and where and what is working so that they can try and, again, leverage their efforts and maybe create some sort of um, community navigation program. Josh, sure, thanks. In, yeah, Denise, go ahead. The Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening Program does a lot of patient navigation but that wouldn't be for all of our clients. But in our pilot site, we did employ uh, a nurse to be a patient navigator to work with the patients from that pilot site on screening uh, and going from screening to diagnosis to treatment. But it's not statewide for all, all payer sources that I know of. Understood. Thanks, Denise. Yeah, it still sounds like that person in place would provide some of those services. So that certainly, I think, um, gets to that question. Um, so I think it's time to wrap up uh, this afternoon's Q&A session. I do want to thank everyone for, for asking questions. I want to thank all of our state participants for providing some candid answers. And I want to let all the participants know that if you have a further question or if due to time we were unfortunately not able to get to your question, um, the contact information from all of our state partners uh, presenting today uh, are on their slides, so you will be able to get in touch with folks and, and ask follow-up questions um, and reach out to those folks. Um, but before we conclude, we would like to, uh, as promised, provide a quick introduction uh, on the ASTO Breast Cancer Online Toolkit, which is a new comprehensive web tool we are launching today as part uh, of this webinar. And the purpose of this toolkit uh, is to make the resources, uh, best practices, and, and reports from throughout this learning community available to a wider audience. Uh, and the, the toolkit was developed by a multidisciplinary team of ASTO staff, uh, our ASTO consultants, um, learning community partners, uh, and it was tested by a number of state and national level stakeholders. Uh, and while the toolkit is a complete online resource in its current form, we will continue to make updates and additions to the toolkit content to ensure that it is as complete, up-to-date, and user-friendly as possible uh, looking ahead to the future. Uh, the online toolkit, which is available um, at that URL you see on screen, www.asto.org slash breast cancer, is organized into six different sections. And I'll go through really quickly and provide uh, a brief overview of the content available uh, in each section. But um, this is not meant to be just something that, that we present to, to you all joining us on the webinar this afternoon. We want you to uh, visit the toolkit yourselves and uh, share us your candid feedback on the resources it has and its usability. Um, because the toolkit has a number of different sections, there are a number of ways in which 
uh, you can use the toolkit in breast cancer control and, and disparities. The information provided can help you access breast cancer-specific data sources, uh, articles from the journal literature, and other resources. Uh, the toolkit also contains a comprehensive list of stakeholders that you might consider involving in your efforts to identify and address breast cancer disparities. Uh, you can search through lists of evidence-based interventions to close disparities in an effective and sustainable manner, and you can also present data findings to both internal and external stakeholders by reviewing examples and utilizing ready-to-use report templates that have been developed by ASTO throughout the learning community. And if you do all of the above, which is a tall order, but if you manage to do all that, then you will have mirrored the, the full journey uh, that ASTO's learning community uh, states have taken to date over the last almost two years. So going section by section here, the About section of the toolkit uh, serves as a homepage for the remainder of the toolkit, and it provides a brief overview of the learning community, though certainly not as in much depth as what Alicia kicked us off with this afternoon. And it also highlights the role that key partners like CDC and ESRI have had in supporting ASTO staff and our state teams over the course of the learning community. Uh, the second tab, the Needs Assessment tab of the toolkit, discusses the importance of community needs and assets assessments, and it also provides links to uh, ASTO and external resources on this topic. I know that Susan G. Komen community profiles are, are featured in this section as a, as a strong external resource. Uh, the section also contains a full list of different stakeholders that a state team could consider bringing on board as part of a multidisciplinary team uh, to close disparities in breast cancer mortality. Uh, the resources section contains dozens of online data sources and other resources organized into three different sections, uh, public use data sets, proprietary or limited use data sets that might be restricted to some folks or might require payment to fully access, as well as quality improvement programs and accountability measures. And an additional subsection on GIS mapping tools and examples will be coming soon as that is of course, is also a key component of our learning community to date. Uh, the approaches section is organized as a literature review that explores six key questions on breast cancer disparities with ample references from the journal literature. And this section also includes a complete reference list with online links to nearly 50 articles cited in that section. The recommendations section is designed to help states identify and implement evidence-based interventions that can close disparities in breast cancer mortality based on the areas and or populations that one might identify as being of greatest need. Um, different listings of evidence-based interventions are provided as part of that section, along with a thorough explanation of the plan, do, study, act, cycle strategy that ASTO uh, utilizes to encourage stakeholder groups to test, adapt, and implement evidence-based interventions. The tool section contains examples and templates of different reports that ASTO partners and learning community teams have developed, including uh, data reports with GIS maps, one-pager overviews that summarize data findings and describe action plans, and also sample white papers and journal articles. And state teams are currently working on finalizing state snapshot documents that provide a full overview of their findings and activities from the past two years. And as part of ASSO's commitment to make this toolkit, toolkit uh, as updated and user-friendly as possible, we want to collect uh, success stories from any state and local teams, that, uh, including you listening this afternoon, uh, that have used any element uh, of the toolkit to better identify and address breast cancer disparities in your areas. So if you have any success stories to share, you can please feel free to send them to me via email. And those will not only be part of the toolkit, but those will be circulated to ASTO memberships uh, and our newsletter readers. And so I hope you'll take a moment once again to explore all the information and resources we have available um, on the toolkit, and again, that is the link there. So as we approach the, the final minute of the webinar this afternoon, I want to turn things back over to Alicia for some including remarks. Alicia? Thank you, Josh. Um, as we wrap up, we would like to let you all know, um, following this webinar, you're going to be directed to a survey. Um, that link to the survey will also be made available to you in a follow-up email where we'll have the presentation slides and other um, presentation materials available for you there. So please take a minute to complete that survey. It helps to provide us with useful information about future webinars and other um, convenings. Um, this concludes today's webinar. And on behalf of the entire ASTO team, Josh and I would like to thank all of today's speakers, all of the State Health Department staff, 
um, the local, state, and national partners that have made the learning community possible, and especially the CDC. A recording of today's webinar will be sent to you all via email and will also be available on the ASPA website in approximately two weeks at um, the web address on your screen now. You can also reference the second link that you see to directly visit our online toolkit, which we strongly encourage you all to do that, and also reach out to us with any feedback. If you have any other follow-up questions regarding today's webinar or the online toolkit, please don't hesitate to reach out to Josh or myself. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye, everyone.